I just want to show you guys, if you haven't been here, this is our space. We have, let me show you your well, Vicente. I don't know if you've seen it yet. Looks well, good. let me go ahead and introduce you since you're here. Vicente Tellas is a noted Santaro, multiple prize winning for his work, both historic and traditional, as well as very contemporary. Thank you for sharing some of your newer pieces with us. They're very moving and I'm looking forward to hearing you talk more about them. Do you want to tell us about these pieces here and then you can tell us about your process and show us around your studio? I'm outside or, right now, but... Just tell us, we can talk about the pieces. I, if, if you go to gallery view, you can see my screen and mm -hmm. hear Vicente talk about them. So what would you like to know? <laughs> well, I'm very curious, these three pieces, and then there's one more, but it's on the other side of the gallery, so I don't want to brush over and make everyone nauseous. Do you want to talk about these three pieces first, and then we'll move to the cactus? Yes. Um, first, I want to just introduce myself. Um, I'm Vicente Teas. Um, I live here in Albuquerque, um, South Valley, to be specific and I created this body of work with the idea of the memories of childhood or memories that you know have lasted with me throughout these years and um, I feel these pieces are you know are some of the foundations of you know why or where and why, you know, continue to do my art. You know, I'm gonna start off with the carreta down there. Um, it's a wheelbarrow that we used to use to, to clean, you know, the family yard. So, you know, we used to push that around and work and work and work. And I think with, the, I, with, with that, you know, being instilled with a, a work ethic from a, a young age and having pride of place that, you know, it, it's helped me in, in my, um, my art endeavors like, you know, making art is, is work and it's full time and it's a passion and it's something that, you know, to take pride in. Um, and because of the, you know, that hard work and, you know, having a respect for, you know, a lot of that stuff, you know, it, it's something that's a memory for me. And then, and the, the Sia, the chair, when I started painting, this was the chair that my grandfather made down I want to say in the CCC camps during in the wartime, um, and that is the chair that I started painting on. This chair that got my, you know, took a lot of hours sitting in to paint and try to come up with the formula or my my, my own voice um, for creating the art. Um, and you know, just the idea of now, you know, doing woodwork is like something that's quite interesting. Um, and exciting to me, um, you know, I, I, I like to think that, you know, I, I can't be separated from, you know, a lot of this, you know, who I am as a Nuevo Mexican, ideas of what creating and what art is and what community is. Um, and then we can go to the, the descanso, uh, the descanso en paz, um, the crucifix with the water bottles is, you know, kind of elaborating on the idea of seeing these roadside shrines for those who are lost, but this is for a shrine for those who, you know, have may have lost their lives along the border um, because of the lack of water or, you know, the these people emptying, emptying the water jugs. And, you know, considering the, the ephemeral, idea, ephemeral idea of the fabric and the sarapes and the paper, the idea that these are things that can be used wasted put away and you know not be concerned with so that's kind of uh the idea of you know how you know growing up listening to the church bells ring every hour and you know the cross ever present from my yard and the church down the street and we have you know behind me where i, I grew up there's uh three crosses on the hill for the cemetery, the Calvario. So it's these things that are just stuck with me and these images that are just burned into the essence of who I am. So that's a little bit about those. I wondered when I was looking, especially at the chair and the wheelbarrow, 
and maybe it's just that your name is Vicente, uh, but it really called to mind the work of Vincent van Gogh, who did a piece very similar to the chair, where well, he that's... showed himself sitting in a similar chair with a similar color background. Well, that's where I've, I've got that, like the idea of the inspiration for, for that series is the idea of, of Vincent's work. Um, he's probably one of my favorite artists, um, not only because he's my tocayo, but because I just see the passion and the brushstrokes and the, the color palette is very, very appealing to me. And two, you know, it's very, for me, it ties in with the idea of the horizon line is, a, is in the New Mexico Santos, the tradition of the Mexico Santos. There's usually, you know, a horizon line like that. So it's also playing with the idea of bringing the, the, Euro, the Eurocentric idea of what fine art is into the idea of what I'm making is considered folk art or, you know, religious art. Like where do the two mesh? Where do they differ? And where do I, I, where do I fall into that, into that line? So it's playing with the idea of, you know, having some kind of, you know, familiarity with it, um, with the image or even just the background and inserting who, who, who I feel I am and what I want to say to people who are, are viewing the work. Well, I think your work and Vincent van Gogh's work both explore the idea of, of everyday life and how it ties very strongly into the spiritual, to the historic, to so many other ideas. If you think about Vincent van Gogh with his chair and his room, tying it into a specific place and time to, uh, he, he was really appealing to the religious values that were instilled in him. And I, I see in all three of these pieces, they're so much more than what the, just the objects being represented, that it's the chair, but the beauty of the carving and the way you captured it, I can see the, the grain of the wood and the, you, you feel the hand of the artist who carved the chair through your your painting of it and the image of the bottles that is a, it's it's a fun play on what's really there and what's not you've got the real serape which is so localized it tells us so much about culture than with the bottles here's your image of a cactus sorry to get my shadow there do you want to tell us about this piece Yes, um, I don't know if you can hear the ice cream man in the background, but uh, I painted that piece with the idea, um, like a, a border series, the idea that nature is sacred, the land in which they're plowing through is sacred to the indigenous down there, and the idea that the utter destruction of both the man and nature is like how awful it is. You know, it's another one of those kind of telling it in Vincent's way, putting it into a familiar format, but telling our stories or the people's stories along the border and the destruction, you know, be paint in the way where they're drawn into the piece, you know, rather than repulsed before they even get to understand what the story is saying, um, kind of just reeling them in so that they have time to think about what is really happening they're not keeping people out. They're they're destroying humanity, and mm -hmm. the ecology. Uh, that, that's to me what that piece is about. That's something about the way you captured the piece and you outlined everything in the red that gives it that sense of, of danger. Something that you all automatically know that this is something that is harmful. Yeah. And it, you it's... captured the humanity of of saguaro cacti. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was. It's actually uh, a lot. The is anthropomorphic. I came across an image that looked just like that, and it and it 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 made me sad to think that you know we tend to believe that plants and animals are non-feeling, and it's like oh, that's just not true. There's you know we got to impart our humanity on them to have empathy, and I think the whole piece, it, the whole group of pieces are to show that we need empathy and you know to lack empathy is just is mind-boggling to me mm -hmm. i know i lived part of my childhood in arizona in southern arizona where there were some amazing saguaro cacti those are the cacti that look like a person standing with their arms raised and they're so ancient they're such ancient bless you they're such ancient 
plants. And sometimes people would go in there and use them for target practice, which was just so upsetting, so disgusting. Like somebody shooting a person that these cacti have lived longer than anyone visiting. And yet some people had just disregarded it. There was something about the, the, the wall that always struck me, which is it reminds me so much of Richard Serra's noted piece, Tilted Ark, which was set up, I don't know if you know the story, it's a famous, it's a big story in the, in the 80s and it has to do with art, uh, art and law, but he constructed this big wall. Richard Serra is known for his big metal structures, but it was so, uh, it bisected the plaza in front of a building and people found it so obstructive that they insisted that it be, that it be removed and they took it down and it led to this huge lawsuit. But there's something about the, the way the wall is structured it is so big and imposing and upsetting to look at that it, it's, um, I feel like we need a lawsuit for it. And do you want to talk about your choice of frame? I don't know. It, it, it just felt right. I don't have any particular reason okay. why I picked that frame. Just kind of well, yeah. the idea, you know, the there's mud worked into that stuff. So the the brown is actually like a clay worked into the, into the frame. Mm-hmm. It does just, have a wonderful Baroque elaborate sensibility that yeah. goes nicely with the cleanness of the painting. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Vincent. I'm going to talk to Suzanne for a bit. If you can hang out, we can talk more about process in a minute. So I'd like to welcome Suzanne Lopez, a noted Santana carver, someone who does lichas uh, and, and skulls. She, in her work, combines her two passions, one for art and the other as a therapist. I think her work brings the historic into an interest, a wonderful psychological space. We are so pleased that we are sharing seven of her nichos that explore the divine feminine. I'll give you a little overview and then we'll stop at them. And we also have some of her beautiful jewelry in our case, which is so fun. We've been playing with it today, get it set up. Um, so Suzanne, thank you so much for being with us. It's my pleasure. And thank you so much for giving me the privilege to show in your fabulous and beautiful gallery of Vicente and other fantastic artists. Well, do you want to talk to us more about these Nichos? I know you mentioned the, the idea of the sacred feminine. So all my nichos, it was like Vicente was talking about, they're shrines. Shrines to remind us of things, to inspire us. It's like he lives in a place where the church bells were ringing and there's churches. And in the Southwest, you're going to see all over. And as you go down into the Americas, people making shrines in their homes, nichos on the rocks, all calling very frequently to the image of the divine feminine. I like the image of Guadalupe in that she appeared to a marginal Indian and she created beauty where there was none. So she had all these extraordinary roses that appeared where there weren't roses like that for hundreds of miles away. And if you look at history, the energy of the divine feminine comes in always to create beauty and to allow new things to um, passed through. So <clears throat> she, she spoke to people who were marginal. All women seem to be marginalized all over the world. And so as we start to look at the beauty that women create in gardens, if they go into a man's home and um, when they're younger into his apartment, he's going to have mustard and beer in the refrigerator and she'll go in and make good food there and make beautiful linens and towels and create beauty where there was none. And so how do we keep creating and allowing beauty? And I love what Vicente was saying, like my work is really folk art, but I feel like what is the difference between folk art and fine art? I think all art is fine art and comes for the purpose of holus and healing, not only for the artist, but for those who observe it. It's like Vicente was talking about it calling you in, pulling you in. So, you know, there's a Nicho for Our Lady of Sandia and the mountains and the beauty of the balloon fiesta and the sky here and the color that the mountain changes in terms of becoming a watermelon and the beauty of the desert for us. 
And the um, La Signora de la Cocina um, is the beauty that women create in the kitchen, um, where we have in this particular nicho handmade pieces of all of the accoutrements that they use in Mexico and down through the Americas to create food. And when we give food and we share food with our families, with our friends, with people that are in need, we bless them and we give them nutrition. And you find that if you make food and your intention is to create um, healing, that people become better from the food you hand out at the table in your home or outside in a barbecue. And so the blessing of what it means to come together and have the divine feminine energy in the kitchen to heal us and share love and caring and connection both from the earth. It's like, you know, Vicente was saying, people don't think that the, the plants and the animals have feelings when in fact, they're filled with all kinds of feelings and nutrition and energy to share with us. And so as a woman, when you cook and you give food to those you love, your children from your breast in the very beginning, and then your family and friends at your table, not only do you feed them food, but often conversation that inspires them or prayers that heal them. So I'm always looking to see where is that energy that we need to pay attention to on the journey of our living and our homes. Um, the Nicho of Our Lady of Passion, the, the divine feminine with all the roses, if you go over to that piece there, it's like, where are you feeling the passion of your life? And it, it embodies all of the beautiful roses that came into the desert but the large rose is it, that is the passion in your own soul, in your own heart of what is it that you're impassioned about? You know, that's beyond your duties or you're having to go to work. What calls your soul and your spirit into being in a higher way? So it's like reminding us when we look at the shrine um, and the Nicho is really a word for altar or shrine in Spanish. You know, when we look at it, what are we seeing and how does it inspire us to be thinking again? What is our life's passion? Have we missed it? Do we need to find it again? You know, how do I reignite it if I got tired or if I was in the COVID binge watching TV and not paying attention to my creativity and my allowing? I mean, the other thing about divine feminine energy, it is the energy of creating and letting, allowing things to occur and to flow through us. And like when a woman has a child, she cannot um, stay every day and say, okay, today's the day you're making your fingernails and now you're going to make your kidney. So I have Our Lady of Sobriety, La Señora de Sobriety, um, as an image because when people get, um, their spirit gets tainted, by alcohol, which we know in this state is horrible for the native people and my, my, my brothers and sisters who are Hispanic, they need help. You cannot get sober and stay sober and free yourself from that addiction without help, without divine spiritual help. And so this is our lady of sobriety to help raise the consciousness and let them know that there is a loving energy to rock them into a new consciousness and into sobriety. Because I see this, the nightmare of alcoholism and meth addiction here in this city. When I go to certain parts of town and people are passed out in the, on the dirt really and on the concrete from drinking all night and all day and they can't get up. And so it's really to be inspired by the loving gaze. And this particular Madonna has glass eyes that move when you walk in front of her so that you can see always that we are being followed by the loving energy of the great mother, of mother earth and sister moon and the spirit of what brings us to this planet to find out what our unique and divine gift is to give. And when you go to the, the Nicho of peace, it's like, what is it that we need to be seeking today in our own country and in the world? It's like a place of peace and health and well being. And we need that divine caring energy to help lift us up to that place where we can <sighs> exhale and go, oh, I feel like grace is spreading all over me. No, it's like that soothing sound that Vicente heard his whole life. It's embedded in him of the sound of the church bills that in there, there is some kind of grace. Can we allow it to fall on us? And we know 
and the science of research about mysticism and prayer, it doesn't matter if your prayer is the Southwestern prayer of the Catholic church or of the great desert or of the native peoples. We know now scientifically all prayer works. So any kind of altar or nicho that you do will bless you, it will remind you of your connection to that divine source energy, which fills our whole universe with light and grows the Socorro cactus and takes us to really magical places. And you can see in a couple of the other nichos, pull back because I'm not sure which ones are next to that piece. Oh, St. Francis. So he's, he's like this patron saint of all the animals and plants really to remind us that we need to pay attention to the birds and the bees and the lizards and the butterflies that all of this is an important part of what keeps us whole and feeds our spirit as human beings. So how do we keep feeding our spirit and lifting our vibration higher and higher as we grow and we keep going? So all of my altars are really about the reflection of that. You know, what do we need to be more mindful of? What do we need to be reminded of? What do we need to lift our spirits into a higher vibration and pay attention. And sometimes it's just to be still and stand in front of a nicho or go into a church, whether it's a mosque or a Catholic church or a Mormon temple to be still and feel that wherever there are two or more are gathered, there's a higher vibration of energy. And I think we can all say from the COVID and from what's been going on on our planet, we need higher vibrations to lift each of us up individually and as communities and as countries. So my thing is the, the altars and the nichos in all different forms. And these are held in the traditional sense of like a little church or something you'd see on the side of the road or in a household as you travel through the Americas, through Mexico, down through Central America to feel how people are calling that spirit into their lives, regardless of their circumstances, whether they're rich or poor. Thank you, that was a beautiful consideration of these amazing pieces. The other thing I wanted to say yep. Yep. while you're moving it is that yeah. all of my artwork is using recycled materials. It's all from things that I have found, remade, repurposed, so that everything has been redone, repurposed and reshaped because I think we have to keep recycling our thoughts, our prayers, our feelings, and the things that make us um, raise our vibration and see a larger picture. So I just wanted to make that point that all of the work that you see that I do now with my skulls, with my altars, with my nichos is all recycled materials and repurposed. I love how you both touched on the idea of the term craft, which is something that tends to have a derogatory meaning in the art world, like, oh, it's craft, it's not art. What's interesting is how then the fine art artists, usually those who are uh, from, you know, European men, American men, take over the folk art ideas, the aesthetics, the materials, and then it becomes fine art, but only in retrospect. And I feel like these differentiate, these, these categories are not as not that helpful they're, they're they're just they're really an expression of um monetary capitalistic systems in place mm -hmm. and that idea it's it's so important to realize that the all these all these labels are really something that's imposed from the outside i also think it's really important to be mindful that Everyone who makes art, whether it's the art of food preparation, um, fine art, folk art, um, drawings that they do just to share with friends and family, um, from the beginning of time, all art, music, and dance has been medicine. That you were in your community and you made art, you danced together, you sang together when you were celebrating and when you were in pain. And you didn't go to the doctor and take some pharmaceutical drug to not feel what was happening, that you had a place to fully express what was going on. And that expression, as you work with that expression, becomes more evolved and defined 
the longer you let it flow through you. And it will sh take different shapes and different forms, but it is medicine. It's medicine for the maker and for the viewer that helps us heal and heal others. And it's really important people go, well, I'm not an artist, I don't know how to paint and draw. And I did workshops for a long, long time, having people just bring things from their junk, junk drawers and make altars and guys who were executives that thought they couldn't ever do it. And people, I don't know how to draw. And in each of us lives the flame of the full expression of our hearts and our souls and things that we're aware of that come out in the creation of art. And that's actually here, the, the word Hojo, the name of our gallery is Gallery Hojo. And it's based on a series of work that the founder of this gallery, Rhett Lynch did. He did a series of works called Hojo. And it's a Navajo word for interconnectedness, order, balance, health, uh, health, vitality, beauty, all of these are sort of combined together. And it's the health of the individual, it's the health of the culture, it's the health of the earth. It's, it's on all different levels linking together that when the world is in harmony and beauty, then there is health. And it's um, one of our founding principles is that we want to bring beauty and healing um, through art, which is not to say that art can't be, uh, can't embrace things that are unpleasant, that it should be a reminder to, of, of different things, just as bitter food makes food taste better. <laughs> I think we need many things, but it's all in the, in the purpose of healing and wholeness for yes. the art, for the viewer. And Vicente, I'm very interested in how, I'm gonna go back to your paintings. It calls attention to something that in New Mexico, we're all very familiar with, which is people who landscape, doing landscape work, people who travel around. And we like to think in New Mexico, we like to think of ourselves as being tricultural and embracing and fair. And yet there are so many economic and cultural and political hierarchies. Mm -hmm. And I'd like how you're calling attention to the implements of landscaping to remind everyone that, to, to bring it into a higher sphere, to, to remind people the beauty of that labor. Yeah, it wasn't beautiful when I was doing it as a kid, but <laughs> you mm. know, it, shaped, it shaped who I am now. Um, you know, it, it taught me that, you know, a, a responsibility that you can't escape. If those weeds they get cut, I stayed outside until those weeds got cut. And until then, you know, I wasn't able to enjoy and have fun and, you know, explore. Um, and I think, you know, when you get away from, from that, um, it's really becomes ingrained in you. Like I haven't done, you know, yard work like when I was a kid in a really long time, you know, living in, in various cities, like, but it it's in me still. Like, it, it, I can hear the sound of that wheelbarrow. I can hear, you know, my brothers cutting the weeds and I can hear the rake going through the dirt. Um, it's something that's, that, that is me. And, you know, I, I'd never, with that, with that being said, I, I would never be able to look look down on some of these people, you know, some people who have to work doing this, you know, doing yard work, yard work, landscaping, odds and ends, you know, they're, they're just as important as, you know, anybody else in, the, in, in society. And, you know, once you start getting back to the memories of how the foundations of who you are were built, you know, a lot of it goes back to having to do yard work or having to do chores and that's just a, an homage to that in, in a way that, you know, painting that was painting it for my family, um, conversations to bring, you know, peace to have in the house that is going to bring up conversations from, you know, yesteryear. Um, so that's, uh, that's how in the personal it is to me. Um, in like the, you know, broad stroke, it is, you know, honoring those who work and honoring those who use their hands. Um, so that, that's what I feel about that piece. Suzanne, could I make a comment on what Vicente was saying? Sure, please go ahead. 
You know, I love what you're talking about, Vicente, but what I see besides your personal experience in your family is all of these men and women who do landscape in a certain way are artists of our land. So they clean out the things that are old and create a space for something new to come into that space. And when I pick the weeds in my garden and my yard, which I have to do every spring at 71 years old, I'm like, ah, I go, you know, I'm pulling them out so new things can come. And I'm creating a new kind of landscape, which in its own way is a certain kind of art to really help the landscape get healed, to be clean, to grow new things. And I love that about seeing people all down the Americas, through Central America, Mexico, here in New Mexico, when people are working and cutting back the trees and opening space for new things to come. It's a beautiful, beautiful um, gift, I think, that we give to our land. And so much labor that takes place whether it's gardening, whether it's cooking, whether it's keeping a home, we view that as being a lesser form. And yet when it's missing, we all feel the lack. Yep. Nobody wants to do the laundry, but nobody wants to run out of clean underwear either. <laughs> or wear dirty clothes. <laughs> uh, or yeah, or go into your kitchen where there's no clean dishes and everything's messy. I really hope that this time during COVID when we've all been home so much might bring about a new appreciation for that kind of labor so that we don't see what we tend to call women's work or things that we don't consider to be a higher level of work. Yet without it, we are all lost. When you talk about men taking over folk art and making it fine art, they also have done that in the kitchen. <laughs> taking over the cooking and becoming top chefs and pushing women out of the kitchen. So it's interesting, this kind of consciousness in our culture to take away who created the opportunity and the opening to bring people together and make wonderful food and to make beauty around us in our gardens and in our homes and wherever we go, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, in the last few minutes that we have, you both strike me as artists who have so many different realms in which you excel in different styles, different media. And when you start, sit down to work on a particular piece, how do you decide what process, how do you choose materials? Do you want to go first, Vicente, or do you want me to go? You can go first. Okay, I mean, I'm happy to bow to you. Um, no. Do a piece ever. So my studio is set up where I'm working on several pieces at the same time. And I start with a certain, I say a prayer. I say my own prayers because we know scientifically all prayer works, whether it's Buddhist prayer, prayer you make up, Catholic prayer, Hindu prayer, it doesn't matter the outcome of things are better when people pray. So I always say a prayer and ask to be guided. And then I start and I have an idea of what I think I wanna do. And in the process, I let the process kind of lead me to where I need to go and things unfold. And then sometimes I'll put my pieces out and then I'm looking at them and I'll change them a month later or two months later and bring them back and redo things that I didn't see before. So I'm kind of doing it all, I'm usually working on two or three pieces at the same time. I don't know how you do it, but that's what I do. <laughs> well, for me, it depends on what work I'm going, going to tackle. Uh, when it comes to my retablos, I try and like kind of be systematic about it. Um, I try and do all the woodwork first, decide what, you know, you know, on the fly, design the boards on the fly as I just cut pieces out to, you know, lengths and then I kind of embellish them from there. Um, but, you know, after the woodwork, you know, it becomes very, you know, have to be mindful of humidity, temperature and all that when I'm starting to gesso the boards, you know, get the get the ground down that the, the mineral pigments and the watercolors adhere to. So, you know, it's always, you know, a battle. Um, trying to have the right you know temperatures and stuff um and when it comes to my more contemporary uh work the use of materials like i've used from you know asphalt shingles to fabrics to papers to you know 
um, all that polypropylene paper. It's just what story I want to tell, you know. Um, usually when I'm using a lot of the fabrics, I try to use fabrics that will tell a story, um, you know, in the background. You know, I've used one where, you know, I've used Pendleton, the Pendleton pattern. You know, it, it, it just kind of depends on what storytelling or what subtle, you know, influences you know that I, I would like in the piece you know it, it's 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 hard hard to say you know it kind of just happens sometimes mistakes i try and go into you know keep the mind that you know i may fail at the pieces i'm going to make but from those failures i'm going to find something that i can be positive and make something out of so it's you know i try not to go into you know even with my santos i've been painting for 13, 14 years, like I try to approach it like I'm going to fail just because I, I don't want to feel that I'm going to be closing myself off from, you know, discovery of something because I'm, a, I'm already afraid to make a mistake. Well, thanks for sharing that. Do you guys want to make some uh, last remarks about the show here or about your work before we let everybody go off and enjoy their Saturday night? I'd say come in and see the show. <laughs> Enjoy my work, enjoy Vicente's work, enjoy your beautiful gallery, enjoy the beautiful Hotel Chaco and the area and walk around and just soak in the mountains and everything beautiful as the spring is coming. That's what I say. Uh, I would just like to, you know, thank everybody participating. Thank the, uh, you know, those who are making beautiful, thought, thoughtful work. Um, you you know, manning, uh, womaning the space of the gallery, uh, being, you know, being, you know, a voice in a city where, you know, there's not, you know, a lot of places to speak up and to, for those to, for those to hear our voices. Um, and, you know, the, the space is, is, it's an amazing space. Um, and hopefully those who roll into town get to check it out. Were there any questions from anyone in the audience? Oh, yes. The gallery is open to the public from noon to six every day except for Mondays. And we are open at other times. If you just email us and ask, we are at galleryhojo.com. We are inside of gallery, uh, sorry, inside of Hotel Chaco. We also have a website with all of our pieces. And uh, please, if there's anything you're interested in, just let us know. We are so grateful to Suzanne and Vicente for sharing their work with us. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Vicente. Thank you guys for joining us. We're gonna try to post this to our website. It was my pleasure. Thank my you. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.